Alright everybody, welcome to another developer live cast here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel. As always, I am still Josh Blaser, and we got a great one for you this afternoon, my time, of course this evening for our guests. We're going to be talking about the game 3030 Death War Redux. This was a game we did a first look on about a month or so ago. And we're, we have one of the developers on to talk about not only the design of the game, but the fact that they've been working on it for now just about 10 years. And we haven't had too many guests on who have spent such a long time on a singular title. So, please welcome from Crunchy Leaf Games, Max Doma. Hi guys. Hey Max, it's great to have you on tonight. How are you doing? I'm pretty good, thanks. It is going to be, I think we're on a very great cast. And I would like to thank you guys for sending me that press kit about, I think that was like two months ago at the time of this recording. Or this taping. Right, yeah. Uh, I think Eric got in touch with you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, our PR contact, yeah. It was good. He, he seemed to have picked someone good to get in touch with there. <laughs> yeah, as I said in the email, I'm not really known for playing Space Sim, so it was definitely interesting to try and play a game like that, kind of like Sight Unseen. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it was interesting for us as well to see someone that doesn't have so much experience with space games uh, play it. And I think, honestly, I think you you did pretty well. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Max. <laughs> but, yeah, it's definitely one of those genres where it's some, it has evolved, I think, to have its own very specific niche group of fans. And I can think of other genres like that, that it can be a little... Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh... I can't make the name of it, demanding, I guess I could say, for people, you know, from the outside trying to get into it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of, uh, like, preconceptions about mm -hmm. what a space sim is. And uh, for people that don't know those, it's probably kind of obtuse uh, mm -hmm. getting into it. I think, I mean, we, we kind of do our best to, to like, uh, ease a new player in. Uh, the tutorial that we added in the Redux version of the tutorial uh, really slowly like shows you the elements uh, that you know you need to know a job console for taking jobs and then how you complete them how you target other stations things like that uh, that space sim players probably would know by heart and a new player to the genre probably has no idea you know <laughs> what they're even doing mm -hmm. and yeah I'm pretty much the same if anyone tries to show me like a grand strategy game or especially like pay a game from Paradox Interactive like those games I just have so much trouble trying to get into yeah, I yeah. I mean, those are pretty complex too. I mean, they do a good job too, of like subtly, you know, showing you the the ins and outs of the game, right? Mm-hmm. And for any kind of genre, especially those that are kind of niche-driven, they've kind of evolved again to have their own hardcore group of fans. But it can be very hard to make that approachable. So. Uh, I know that's probably segueing into a question, but before we get there, Max, for people watching us or listening who haven't heard of Crunchy Leaf or 3030 Death War, could you talk a little bit about your studio and what that game is? Uh, sure. So, um, I mean, I guess I should probably start at the beginning. Uh, so I kind of started teaching myself programming, um, you know, back in college. Um, I started working on a game that, uh, you know, was kind of going to be my my dream space game at that time. Um, and uh, that kind of just, like, kept evolving, like, that, that concept. It, you know, the, the game design kept changing. I kept iterating on it. And uh, while I was making that game, I uh, was doing research, and I stumbled upon, upon this, this other game, 3030 Death War, which I'd never heard of before, and which just kind of blew me away uh, by its depth and by um, you know the amount of content that was in the game already at that point, um, it, it was just like you know no one had ever talked about it. I'd never seen it anywhere, and suddenly there's this game where you can like you know fly around your spaceship, land on stations, you know walk around, talk to people, take jobs on like a, a station console computer. There's all these really super cool small you know elements there uh, that I hadn't even seen before, and still like no one knew about this game. So um, that was kind of the start of 3030 Death War, where uh, I kind of fell in love with it immediately. And uh, the story is that uh, the two original developers of the game, Matt and Mike, they had kind of released it already in 2007, and they had just kind of you know, written it off as 
like not very much of a success to be honest not a lot of people bought it back then and it didn't get much attention mm -hmm. uh, those were the days before steam was a thing too oh, so yes. yeah you have to imagine like if you're a small indie and you have no pr connections and no other way to market your game it's just crazy like it's it's not like even uh like it's not about a thousand or two thousand people knowing about your game it's like about are 30 or 40 going to know about your game like no one knows that you exist so uh yeah that was really disappointing for them and they kind of just you know decided to to let that be that and continue on with other things and so i found the game in the state they they had released it in back then and it was you know there was a lot of things that still had to be worked out and there was bugs and crashes and stuff but i saw like the you know the the diamond in the rough there and so i got in touch with matt uh, one of the developers and I, I offered to you know make a mod for the game and uh, that mod kind of turned into like a re-release of the game uh, which actually got you know some media attention we run rock paper shotgun and a couple other sites and because we got so much attention and because the people were so uh, like excited about this sort of game we decided to um, expand that into the redux version or we tried to expand that into a steam version and that became the redux version that we have today um, so yeah, so we kind of kept on working on the game. I think uh, what was that? Must have been like uh, 2011 or so till 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 now. Uh, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but it's it was also that even that was a long time ago. And um, yeah, and so we released the game in early access just about two years ago now, and uh, released it fully out of early access about half a year ago. All right. And yeah, what you were just saying there, Max, about releasing 3030 Death were the original one that was back in 2008 or 2007. Well, the, the very original release that they did was, I think, 2007. Mm -hmm. And then we did the re-release that I mean, I called it the re-release at that point. That was kind of my 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 pitch to journalists. Uh, that was in 2011. Mm -hmm. And. I think that's one of the more interesting aspects, and I mean, we could probably dig an entire cast of talking about this, that kind of, I guess, the quote-unquote before era of Steam, and yeah. what it's like to be an indie developer when you don't have this centralized platform. I, I think it's, I mean, to be honest, it must have been hell, because, I mean, what, what are you going to do, right? I mean, the thing is, like, back then, uh, I wasn't part of the team, and I don't, I don't have that experience of releasing a game uh, without Steam. Mm -hmm. um, but I can only imagine, like looking at what they went through and looking at, uh, you know, the the little bit that they got going in, in marketing or in, in PR work, and uh, I think it did, you know, it gave them sales in the in the, you know, in the dozens. That's mm. or or even if it was dozens, you know, it was somewhere very very low, and it must be, you know, terribly disappointing to make like this this huge game, this amazing game, and then have no one notice it. So. Um, I definitely make the case for for Steam being a good thing for indies and for it helping in discoverability. Although everyone's complaining about it nowadays, of course, but mm -hmm. I do think it's a good thing in total. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of those very interesting aspects about the game industry, with so many people coming into it over the last decade and not really getting a chance to see what it's like beforehand. And I know there are people out there who despise Steam. They don't like digital platforms, but it certainly has done more good than harm, I think, in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I mean, the huge discussion right now, or at least I, I hear a lot about it, is this discoverability uh, mm -hmm. question. Yeah. And, um, I mean, just taking our game as an example, uh, I, I don't know if it's representative, because, of course, you know, the game has very, very good Steam reviews. We're, we're at, like, 96% right now with over 200 reviews. And uh, I, I guess like we're relatively highly placed in the Steam um, algorithm, um, but the amount of views we get through Steam through the discovery queue specifically mm -hmm. uh, is just astonishing, and uh, it's like it, it's you know a multiple of anything we get through other sites. Even if we do get coverage through like another site or um, a, a YouTube video. The Steam Discovery queue almost always still beats that <laughs> by by like you know by even like a power of something like it's just like ten times more anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I definitely argue that Steam is a good thing for small indies. Yeah, and we've had 
a few chance to talk to like developers like Sandy Peterson and Cliff Harris on the podcast in the past. And yeah, it's definitely I mean, if we had the time tonight, we could probably spend another extra hour or so talking about kind of how much things have changed that way. Now, bringing this back to 3030 Death War, with the version that I play, that's the uh, 3030 Death War, the Redux edition, what, I, like, I guess for the people watching us right now, like, what are like the big marketing points between what's changed from the original to the Redux? Um... Well, I mean, a ton has changed. Uh, I'd, I'd start with um, there's been a complete graphic overhaul, like the entire entire graphics. Uh, we did a lot of work on in, in just increasing, um, you know, graphic fidelity, uh, adding a lot of parallax effects, for example, uh, in space and and also on stations. Um, there's just tons more detail added everywhere. The world the world is really fleshed out. Um, graphics wise and also uh, in other ways um, we have uh, a lot more story like the story has been really uh, built out um, there's more characters there's more story arcs there's there's like complete new side quests that weren't there before multiple ones um, and then there's of course like the entire uh, rebalancing of gameplay um, well values I guess like the, the, all the numbers of the game have basically been thrown thrown uh, you know, went through the shredder once and then kind of came out the other side and had to be rebuilt um, from the base up. And then besides that, we added, of course, uh, you know, modern... Um, uh, how would you say? Like, um, well, I guess just so you can play it in multiple resolutions. The old 3030 Death War was only playable in 800 by 600 for example. So uh, we added things like, you know, uh, supporting all kinds of resolutions. Uh, I think we try to support up to f 4K now, even... Um, and and then of course we fixed a ton of bugs. I mean that was <laughs> that was a whole lot of work too. The game did have a whole lot of crashes uh, initially, and uh, yeah, we managed to I think find pretty much every every one that we've uh, ever come across. <laughs> Great, and again, like as we said before, you guys have been working on this Redux edition for like, we've been working on this game again for just about. 10 maybe even 11 years at this point and that's definitely one of the more craziest aspects of indie development because I've talked to developers who have uh, focused or dedicated themselves to a single game but I think talking to you Max this may be the record for the most amount of time <laughs> I guess here's a question I know uh, for people watching this or listening that I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second but why would you guys decide to focus on one game over 10 years as opposed to just making a sequel or making some other game or a different genre? Yeah, I guess that's a reasonable question. Um, well, I mean, I guess I do have to, like, um, we'd have to take a step back and kind of um, uh, make it clear what actually, you know, happened in development because uh, none of us is working on the game full time. Um, uh, we all have uh, basically main jobs that we do, and then 3030 is more our uh, our side project for all of us. For some more, for some less. And um, I mean, in that time, even the time between 2011 and and now, uh, between that re-release and now, um, we've had periods where there wasn't any development at all, just because. Um, we're, well, I was indisposed for for two years. I was busy with another job entirely, and. Um, yeah, we just gone off and on doing other things basically. So, um, so it's not like you know. I, I don't think anyone could reasonably spend that much time on one game and not go insane <laughs> without releasing it. So uh, yeah, so we're we're definitely not you know that crazy. Um, but nevertheless, of course, we did spend a lot of time you know redoing it um, and kind of. I think the thing was we saw that there was that diamond in the rough that I mentioned earlier, and we all really wanted to get that to shine, and so it seemed like worth you know investing the time into it. Hmm. Now talking about investing that time into Thirty Thirty Death War, for people who have watched us or watched these casts in the past, we've talked about kind of that challenge of knowing what are like the most important aspects to focus on and what are elements that you can either save for later or may just not be a priority enough 
for you to you know commit time, money, and energy to. Now, considering as you just said, Max, that everybody was kind of working on this, you know, as a part time work, this was kind of like the quote unquote second job. I guess, what what did you prioritize in terms of growing the game? Now, you mentioned, of course, it being a diamond diamond or rough, but I guess how did you focus on you know what did I want to make uh, the Redux edition? Like, what were the key aspects that you wanted to uh, delve into? Mm. Well, I mean, <clears throat> for me, it was the mainly the game design uh, aspect of it, the balancing um, aspect. So, uh, the old version, um, I mean, you know, it starts with you know how the ships moved back then. There was there was like a certain uh, um, slips were ships were very 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 slow it was more like a realistic uh take on space travel so the ships were very slow they turned extremely slowly and then they split extremely f quickly and um it ended up you know it was very frustrating because you know just you know going to a station and trying to land was a, a very slow process uh, added to that uh, back in the old version you also had to um besides asking for a docking clearance you also had to like actually dock at the station <laughs> So you'd have to like get in line behind like three other ships, and you have to wait till they all dock. Then you go in behind the last one, and then you slowly and really slowly, or else you get a get fined. Really slowly, you get closer to the docking bay, and then you know the ship finally docks. And that whole process just took you know like minutes. So <clears throat> it was like totally crazy because a, a player nowadays that you know wants to enjoy a game, they're not interested in doing like you know a procedure like that you know ten times, twenty times. Mm -hmm. I mean over the course of the game, a hundred times over. So, um, you know, things like that were just really clear to me that they just had to be, you know, revamped basically for uh, the, a modern audience. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of my take, like getting all the balancing right, getting the mission uh, payouts right. There, there was a lot of time spent with, I think we did like six or seven completely new uh, designs of the mission payouts. Um, getting the story progression and, and like the, the player experience or, or money, I guess, progression right. Um, and then for uh, Mike, who's more on the art side or who does most of the art, uh, for him it was of course getting the artistic side right and getting the you know the graphical enhancements in there that I was talking about earlier. So uh, we both had like our own focus, and you know by each of us focusing on that, we kind of you know improved our own area um, by huge amounts, I think. Mm -hmm. And getting back to that question from earlier, when we were talking about kind of opening up the game to new people or new the genre to new people, as you just said, with some of like the more interesting quirks of the original Thirty Thirty Death War, it's very hard sometimes. I know this is a struggle for a lot of developers to know what elements are key or intrinsic to a respective genre. Like for people who've watched me before, it's like talking about what makes a roguelike. And what elements can you remove and it still keeps that same look and feel? But for a lot of people, they feel that all the elements are required. And if you take them away, it's not the same genre. But with that said, if you do if you keep too many of those quirks, it becomes very hard for a new player, such as myself, and I'm sure many others to try and jump into. So I guess in terms of making the game more accessible. How did you guys approach that, like trying to dial back some of the more, I guess, uh, crazy quirks of Space Sim versus trying to make the game more appealing to new players? Mm, yeah, no, we definitely did a lot of that. Um, I mean, number one would be that, well, the docking that I mentioned earlier, that was a big frustration, I think, for mm -hmm. uh, for me and for other players. Um, but then, um, of course... A, a, you know, a decent tutorial goes a long way. Uh, the old tutorial used to be just like these boxes that would come up, and you you know read what it said. It would say you know you have to do this and this, click that button, and then you click on OK, and the game would kind of just like you know wait for you to do it, but maybe also not. It kind of didn't really care. It wasn't dynamic like that. So um, yeah, it just wasn't a very good tutorial at the beginning. And uh, adding a good tutorial um, and expanding that tutorial, like building upon that, uh, that really helped a lot um, like we started with just a simple tutorial that just covered like the basics movement and stuff like that and then getting to a station and then we we kept on expanding it because it just came became so obvious that you know 
people really need that guidance in the beginning and if you don't give it then they're basically just going to get lost really quickly or, or at one of those points they're just going to lose interest because they're just not sure what they're supposed to do and they don't understand where in which direction you know the game is supposed to go mm-hmm. so um yeah so we kept expanding the tutorial basically i think the tutorial goes on up until like halfway through the game almost because there's always you know these reminders that come up now if you if you you know at some point later in the game if you find a specific weapon it will tell you how that weapon works and there's all kinds of dynamic things that kind of go on that kind of react to what you're doing and then inform you about um you know how you can play the game better Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was really important for us yeah and uh, keeping on with the idea of the tutorial max i actually wanted to expand on that because Good tutorial design is definitely hard to do, and I think it's one of those very underrated aspects, especially for independent developers. And we could even say especially for uh, specifically niche genres, like Space Sim, Grand Strategy, stuff like that. And one of the big pulls of the Space Sim genre, as you're no doubt aware, is that complete freedom to do you know whatever the heck you want within that game space. Same thing with Grand Strategy. But the problem is, how do you teach someone about, you know, complete freedom at the same time you're trying to give them, you know, a structured lesson or a bullet point lesson plan as to how to play your game? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, well, the way that we did it was that, um, for example, right at the beginning of the game, you get given a spaceship that can theoretically travel anywhere, but um, because it's damaged it's uh, slow and it can only realistically travel to one of four stations and we we very much push you towards three stations that are very close to each other because they're closer to you and because you know they're just uh, at the beginning of the station list for example so we think it's extremely likely that a player will land at one of those stations then no matter which station they land at you're greeted by this police officer that uh, takes away confiscates your ship and uh, that kind of serves as like an intro to you know the dialogue system and kind of you know shows you how to make decisions and all that. And um, although you were free in your choice of which station which station to go to, it doesn't really matter because uh, in the end we kind of force the the cop on you and we kind of we just make that happen you know by by game magic. Um, the next point I guess would be uh, when you pick a job. And the way we did that is that we we kind of like you know set up the system in a certain way that only specific jobs would come up that would be attractive to you at the beginning of the game. And it used to be you could take all kinds of jobs, and people would take a job to like a really far away station, <laughs> then start flying there and get really frustrated because their ship was super slow and there was no way they could get there. So we made it like that um, the person offering the job would say, "Oh no, thank you. I'm not interested in going with you. Your ship is too slow." And so by saying that, we'd inform the player that, you know, um, oh, I guess my ship is, you know, in some way slower than it needs to be, and I guess I need to upgrade that in the course of the game. So um, it's kind of like a little, you know, it's still there, it's still open-worldy, but there's a limitation placed on it by us, you know, by, by kind of, you know, simulating this person that doesn't want to go with you, uh, that informs the player that, you know, that's just not a possibility and that they need to improve their ship first. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and that kind of like continues on. Like when you leave the station, the the UI informs you that you should you know go to that station that you just took a mission to, and uh, no matter which station it is, it's usually one of the two stations that are close nearby. Um, it all you know just kind of naturally uh, works out. So um, I think you kind of have to. What you need to do is you need to kind of think of it in like a world building way. The world needs to be built in such a way. Uh, in an open world game, the world needs to be built in such a way that. Uh, it's natural for the player to do certain things that are good for teaching them and then the tutorial needs to be dynamic enough to um, to react to what the player is doing and you know uh, lead them in a certain way that you know doesn't ruin the open world experience for them and instead kind of naturally shows them of how you know way to to progress in that world mm-hmm. and yeah, again that's very important I like how you kind of described it it's open-ended in terms of how you play the game, but it kind of, you know, casually or behind the scenes guides the player towards these specific actions or these specific tasks that they'll have to do. As you said, like a good example is when you land, whatever station you land at the start, that kind of starts that quest line of you lose your main ship, now you have to go do something else. 
Yeah, right. Those are just the kind of things you need to. I mean, that just kind of come up by um, by iteration, I guess. Like mm-hmm. the tutorial itself, uh, we we just iterated on uh, tons and tons of times. I, I went um, uh, here in Berlin, where I live. We have these these game meetups that are called. Uh, it's called Talk and Play, and uh, it's a space where like indie developers can show their games, and people can you know visitors can just play them. And then you know you talk about them, you give feedback on them, you can ask the players questions about them. It's just a really practical way of getting you know lots and lots of feedback on your on your game quickly, because it's not something that you can usually do, right? It's really like for some people, it's it's fairly hard to get feedback on your game, um, you know, without I guess hiring someone to do it for you, or um, I wouldn't even know what you know what other solution there is. So that was really good for us. We went to this this talk and play often. We had people play. Uh, we noticed where they would you know get lost, and then we specifically fixed the tutorial to address those things. Um, yeah, I mean, I, if honestly, like if we didn't have that, I I really don't know where the tutorial would be now because <laughs> that just helped us out a ton. I guess here's a question for you, Max. With your experience in the space sim genre. What do you think is one of like the biggest traps that people fall into when trying to learn a game of this type? You mean when a player learns? Yeah. Like if someone brand new is trying to play this game, where do you think like like what do you think are some of like the more I guess harder to learn aspects that they can kind of get slipped up on? Well, I guess going from our our forums and like what people, you know, occasionally we do get complaints um about the game, um, I guess it would be the open world and nature of it. Um, so, I think a couple of times people were, you know, they come on and they'd say something like, "Oh, I just did the tutorial and now I'm out, you know, at the first station. What am I supposed to do now?" Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, to someone who knows space sims and who generally, you know, knows open world type games, that's really weird because you'd think like, "Well, just." you know, explore the world, do stuff, you know, we showed you how to do jobs, we showed you how to do, you know, just do some of those things. But I think there's a certain type of player that, that, I mean, I guess because of lack of experience, or I don't know what, but they really don't know how to handle an open world, you know, it just is too much for them, or um, they need more guidance. So, um, if anything, I think, you know, you'd, you'd probably need to build it in some sort of like uh, like a check or a hook uh, game design wise that kind of finds out if players are obviously missing, uh, the, you know, the important open world aspects and then kind of guide them back in there. Um, you know, we tried to do our best with that, but but still, apparently there are people that just don't don't get that. And you kind of need to you probably need to catch those people somehow. Mm hmm. And I guess, like, for myself, one of the things I had a little bit of trouble with were, was kind of the control scheme for the game. And I want to get your thoughts on that, Max, in terms of how did you guys settle on the UI that you wanted the player to interact with? Um, well, that went through a lot of iterations. Um, I mean, uh, I have to think back now. Um, the thing was, the first UI was was very very tiny like it was these very tiny buttons and um, they were all just really gray and all looked exactly the same so uh, that made it really difficult for a new player to kind of figure out what's going on um, and then pretty close to the one, 1.0 release actually we, we just completely threw out all that and we replaced it with um, you know this new UI scheme that we have now um, where we just, you know, basically we just made things bigger. We made buttons bigger. Um, you make them bigger. You give them, you know, clear uh, iconography. And um, uh, I think, I mean, we did try to place them a little bit more, um, you know, um, noticeable. And then we also added things like, um, you know, small things that you kind of need to think about. Like, uh, um, will a player really know uh, how his cargo works? Like, will all people understand how cargo works? Probably not. So what we did is that once you've collected your first cargo, uh, there's this big pointing arrow that kind of just pops up on your screen and it points towards your cargo um, supply or your cargo bay at the top. And it says click. So you click on it and then it opens the cargo bay and then you see, you know, oh, I just collected that cargo. 
and um, and so the player suddenly understands, you know, the you know what he just collected apparently went into his cargo bay, and now it's full or it's half full or whatever. Um, so you know, a little thing like that, you kind of have to you kind of have to I think dynamically adjust or or, or add little pointers um, that help pay players, you know, figure out these these specific mechanics uh, that most people probably don't know. Yeah, and it's always one of the more fascinating aspects of UI design in terms of how you're kind of trying to lead the player into looking at certain aspects of it. But it can be very hard, I think, for someone new. And I know, like, for myself, whenever I try to play a game like a space sim genre or especially grand strategy, that I'll turn it on and I'll see, you know, one UI command bar at the top, another UI bar command bar at the bottom, and I'm like, what the heck am I looking at here? Like, where the heck am I supposed to go with this? Right. No, I really hate that, too. I don't... Like, to tell you the truth, I, I don't know why games still do that nowadays. Like, occasionally you'll still still see a game that kind of just bombards you with um, insane amounts of UI right from the start. Mm -hmm. A game I've just recently been playing, Frostpunk, I think I saw you mm -hmm. played it as well. Yeah. Yeah, that did UI extremely well, I thought. Um, just... I mean, it's the way it should be, right? It hides abstraction mm -hmm. behind uh, a few menus, and also it, it limits its its complexity uh, to just the things that you really do need to know. And then it also does a lot of things visually, like s the simple thing of uh, turning on the heat overlay in Frostpunk. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I probably shouldn't talk about too much about Frostpunk because not everyone knows that, but uh, that shows you basically how warm every house is in your colony, and warmth is a really important aspect in Frostpunk. So um, instead of showing like menus or bars or like going into any you know sub menu, it just does it all visually. You click on one yeah. button, bam, everything is kind of colored, and you know what's going on. So that was a really smart way I thought of you know solving a, a difficult UI problem. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite examples of like a really good, excuse me, really good UI was from City Skylines, where it uses a dynamic UI so that again it hides information the player doesn't need and pulls up relevant information when they're trying to find something specific towards a certain civic sort. Oh, I'm sorry, certain civic uh, service. So if I want to look up fire, or if I click on the fire department, I now have the entire fire overlay about what are the most dangerous parts of my city. If I click on education, I get, you know, what houses are currently having access to school. And again, as we said, it's just a great way of keeping the player's focus onto these immediate tasks. And yeah, I've played way too many grand strategy games where it's just like, I have 15 different buttons highlighting and clicking and telling me to do stuff. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And this goes back to what we were just saying a few minutes ago regarding a good tutorial. Because way too often when it comes to these grand strategy kind of designs, the tutorial is either very passive, as in you're just watching someone play, or it's so heavily scripted that you're kind of, you know, teaching the player the wrong lessons. You're telling them that they should always do A through Z, but again, the point of the open-ended genre is that anything can happen, or that you're supposed to kind of uh, extrapolate what's happening and then grow out in that direction. Yeah, I, I didn't even think of that before, but now that you mention it, um, I mean, probably the grand strategy genre is the hardest to make a tutorial for like just yeah. you know thinking of genres I, I can't imagine a more difficult thing to make a, a tutorial for um, uh, I'd probably I you know now I'm thinking I probably want to go back to those games like Crusader Kings or Europa Universalis and just mm -hmm. study the way the tutorial works because um, that must be extremely difficult you're right like there's there's so much complexity and the games those games live from complexity I mean you know, why do people enjoy those games? Because they have so many moving parts and you can, like, you know, figure out how to machinate them in a certain way that, you know, benefits your country or your faction. Um, so they do need that complexity, and I think they also probably do need all those buttons, you know? There might be a way to reduce them in some way, but, you know, there probably isn't a way to get around having just a ton of buttons at some point. So, um, yeah, that would be fascinating to go back to, to look at. Mm-hmm. And, as we said, it's one of the more f crazy parts of older game designs. Because I've played a lot of classic games as well, and they can be very rough when it comes to educating a new player. 
and to do a quick time check I know it's about just after three my time we've been going for just about 37 minutes so I figure we'll go for maybe another 20 minutes if that works for you Max and then we'll wrap it up for today yeah that sounds great okay, okay. but again back to the topic a lot of older games tend to uh, front load everything in the manual that there really isn't a in-game tutorial to teach people on but from our original topic way back at the start of this we kind of talked about how things have changed in terms of game development and game design philosophy and you really do need to be able to teach the player through gameplay these days or they're just not going to have the time to learn things otherwise yeah I think that's true um, I mean you know well known fact is probably that you know people are just the tension spans are just so much shorter nowadays. So, mm -hmm. um, even in a, a grand strategy game that would you know you'd expect people to be willing to put more time into, um, no one wants to read you know 50 pages of tutorial uh, or of manual to get into a game nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that, and it's probably a good thing. You know, it's just that p games have evolved to a point where people expect this sort of dynamic um, teaching and um, I don't know, like in recent memory, I'm trying to think of one that, that really went against that that whole dynamic thing. Um, I think there's some games that do it more and some that do it less. Like, um, as an example, there's some games where uh, it's a shooter, like a, like a top-down roguelike shooter, and uh, the controls will just be like uh, drawn into the level. Like it will say WSAD, uh, move your character, and then you know, you know to do it. And then like left-click to shoot these dolls up here, and then you shoot them. But none of that reacts to you. It's all just kind of like drawn into the level on like maybe a signpost or maybe just into the level or maybe just on your UI. So um, that's like I think the the lazy way of doing it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's you know the the more dynamic way where you really just go step by step um, and um, you let the player kind of find their own path and then react really dynamically to what they're doing at that moment. Uh, going back to Frostpunk, uh, it also does that well. Like it teaches. Um, at the very beginning, it, it doesn't really tell you much. It doesn't tell you anything, and then it kind of just, you know, slowly, uh, you know, ponderously says, you know, well, you might want to collect coal because, you know, you want to get your generator running, mm -hmm. and then, so you do that, and then it teaches you about, you know, the housing, and then, you know, very, very slowly, these elements come together, and you're never overwhelmed. Is the nice thing, you know, it's really, really slowly teaching those things. Um, so. Yeah, I just think like the the more dynamic a tutorial can be, uh, I think the better it is, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would also say that it you really do want the player to start getting into things. Like, again, I've played games where the tutorial is just me watching the game play itself for like three to five minutes. Yeah, and that doesn't really teach someone about how this game works. Yeah, no, I think that's. I mean. I can understand why people do it because making a dynamic tutorial or making a tutorial at all is is a whole lot of work. Mm -hmm. Like I think probably most beginning or or every beginning game designer, excuse me, just underestimates the amount of work that needs to go into a tutorial. Because mm -hmm. um, you you not only have to like plan it out and and you know iterate on the design, but you also have to build all the systems that support it. So um, if your gun usually works, you know, in a, in, a, in a normal way in the level, then you still have to, you know, make it work in a specific way in the tutorial so that, you know, you can teach the player things. Like in the beginning, it doesn't work. That needs a specific system so that it doesn't work. It needs scripting and it needs, you know, the engine having to support that. Um, so, yeah, so I definitely understand why people would make a video because that's just you sitting in front of the game, playing it, filming yourself, saying a little bit of something and that's pretty much done you know you can get that done in like an hour or two whereas making dynamic tutorial will probably take you months mm -hmm. and again going back to what we said earlier that as developers you have to be really careful in terms of priorita prioritizing how much you spend on a single system and over the course of an entire game development because for a lot of people it goes back to you know how many people are actually going to be interest in a dynamic dynamic tutorial versus actually adding in more game systems but as we've said especially in today's market if you're not careful you may be aiming your game just for a very niche crowd when there is possibility to get new people into the genre yeah i mean 
it's hard to say how much of our um, our players are uh, hardcore space gamers. I I really don't have an idea, um, but I do think a large part of them are just you know general, um, you know your average indie gamer. You know he enjoys he or she enjoys you know any kind of uh, game and kind of just you know saw this game like the pixel art, like that it had you know some aspects of you know talking to characters. And then starts playing it, and then they're like, "Oh, holy, holy moly! There's all this space sim stuff going on now." Um, you know, you gotta you gotta catch those people too, and kind of teach them how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of forgot where the question what the question was <laughs> <laughs> about uh, trying to prioritize what elements. Like, is it better for some people to focus on accessibility of the game? Or to grow out what's already there, to try and hook people of that genre, because right. well, oh, yeah. go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, you do need a certain amount of accessibility, I think, and and that was you know what we measured with those uh, live playing sessions. Um, I I think if you don't have that, then you're just going to miss out on so many players. You know, so many people are not going to um, be able to enjoy your game because just the basic knowledge that you need um, is not there. So. I think there's like some magic barrier, and you know it's really hard to define, but you kind of have to figure that out by playtesting. In best case, um, that you need to have like the minimal um, tutorial experience, and then you know, as possible, you can grow out the game and you know add features on, uh, or even preferably, I think, enrich features that are already there. Um, just adding features for features worth is not really that interesting to me. I think I think it's more interesting to give features that are there more depth. You know, give them more variance, give, make it more interesting, give you something to think about. Maybe, uh, you know, things like that make a game good. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, you've said this several times. I just want to expand for people either watching or listening to us in the future. But the importance of play testing. I think that's a very key aspect. It's one we've talked about many times here on the cast. And I'm just curious, Max, when you did the playtesting for 3030 Death War Redux, did you focus on space sim fans? Did you get people who never play the genre, or did you try to get like a good ratio of both? Um, well, it was it was really mostly at these uh, gaming events here in Berlin. So, um, so I mean, that's pretty much just about anyone. Uh, it could be. You know, some of them were, of course, game designers. There were lots of game designers there too. But uh, of the people running around, it was often, you know, just uh, you know, a, either a gamer that wanted to, you know, try out a couple new games, or just your average Joe that kind of stumbled upon, you know, oh, there's an event happening here. Oh, there's beer. You know, <laughs> I'll just check this out and you know, walk around a little bit. And then you suddenly had this person that had no idea about games, you know, trying out your space sim, your crazy space sim adventure game, and uh, that can also teach you a lot. You know, you just you just realize, you know. Uh, what things are really not um, that straightforward and maybe just, you know, are clear to you because you've been playing games for so long. So that was really an advantage, too, that you just get such a wide mix of people playing the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that we've, again, we've talked about is just being able to get that information from people, especially new players, regarding what they're getting stumped with. And going back to what you talked about earlier, Max, regarding the tutorial. And being able to design such a way to kind of passively guide players around, it's just such a very tricky aspect to balance. And I guess here's another question, I guess, to segue from that. We've talked about things from a new player experience already, but how did you and the rest of Crunchy Leaf kind of decide on how far you wanted to go for expert players? Because, again, with the space sim genre and other niche-based uh, games like that, you can get very in depth in terms of how far you want to make these mechanics complicated and how much you really want to add. I mean, we've played games. I guess a really good example this would be Dwarf Fortress, which I mean, that's a game that people can play for months, if not years, at this point in terms of the complexity and interactivity of the systems. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's lots of games that, or there's you know, there's some games that come to mind that just have insane amounts of death basically and, and offer you know hundreds if not thousands of hours of play um, well for 3030 it was more um, it, it, you know the game is more a, a, a narrative game um, mm-hmm. 
so more in the style of like the adventures that inspired it you know monkey island and and indiana jones and the fate of atlantis like the old classic adventure games and being inspired by those also kind of gives you um an idea of you know the kind of game length and the uh the, the type of experience you want to make because we we don't i mean i guess anyone can play the game their own way of course but we don't focus specifically on um the hardcore sci-fi space game player who wants to you know like an x3 or, or one of those games wants to build out a huge fleet and wants to have like you know tons of stations and have this uh, uh economic imperium um none of those things were really that interesting to us the game is still supposed to be like this you know you're a crap uh, scrappy <laughs> bounty hunter um you're kind of you know doing jobs here and there you're trying to earn your way up and uh you know in the end you're kind of just trying to to um get back at the bad guys that you know took away your ship so um that's really the focus of the game you know it's very like narrative focused and it's really tightly focused and so if we'd have to like pick a, a, a percentage of the players that we focus on it would be those that you know play the game from beginning to end the storyline and then you know maybe keep playing for an hour or two so maybe like you know 15 to 20 hours play time is what is what we kind of go for with the game mm -hmm. now I guess to begin to wrap things up for our cast for today I have a few more questions I'm just thinking about in terms again of that long term design that you guys did for the Redux edition now, as you said, you kind of worked on it as a part-time job with developing the Redux edition over the last 10 years. So I'm, so I'm sure any developers watching this, whether they are students or professionals at this point, are probably curious about this. And that is, I guess, how did the team, I guess, keep focused or keep energized to f work on this game over such a long period of time, even if it was part-time? I guess how how did you guys like keep yourselves going, knowing that you're going to be spending so much of your life, I guess, making this one title? Um, yeah, well, it's nothing we had we hadn't like planned it out beforehand, so we weren't aware that it was going to be such a long time. But um, I think um, well, I mean, it's multiple things. Uh, Well, I guess you have to start there. Like, if you have some initial success uh, with a project, that just goes a huge, like, a really far away, right? So getting this coverage in Rock, Paper, Shotgun that we got after I'd made the initial re-release, and then seeing, you know, people not only play the game, uh, because the game was a pay-what-you-want game at that point, but also pay for the game that was actually free. Um... They were willing to give us, you know, some some gave, you know, one, two, three, five dollars. Some gave like ten, twenty bucks for a game that they hadn't, to, you know, they hadn't have to have give, given anything for. So um, that was just like a huge motivator in itself, and that kind of got us to the point where uh, we could get the early access release out. Um, and then I've got to say, like, after you get early access, it kind of like feeds itself, you know. Um, the, the feedback you get from players and the, the reviews you get on Steam, you know, assuming they're positive, or at least to, to a big extent positive. And for us, you know, the lucky thing was that we were, you know, we were, I think, 100% positive for, for a long time after the game released even. So it was just extremely motivating seeing people come in, enjoying the game so much, and then, you know, giving positive feedback and giving, um, you know, a critique, but, all, you know, suggestions of what we could uh, improve. But... Um, also just you know telling us you know what a great game it was and that it was you know apparently time well spent on our side because what we had made was actually something you know uh worthwhile so uh yeah if i'd have if i had a suggestion i'd pretty much go with you know release you know as soon as early in some way I i'm not sure if you know going full release on steam or even early access is the right way but even if it's just like you know, make it a private uh, a beta or, or uh, you know, some sort of uh, a limited offer for, for a certain amount of players only. But get players playing your game and get feedback from them because there's nothing better to motivate you than feedback from the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst thing you can do is just sit by yourself, make the game, 
you know, question if this is good or bad or, you know, um, you'll keep going in circles and you'll keep going back and forth on a lot of things. And I think feedback from the outside is what's, you know, most important because that will kind of like, uh, it will focus you again on what's what's really actually important about the game. Mm-hmm. Yep, and it's the same thing we've seen with early access on Steam and be able to get so many people to look at your title. Because as you just said, Max, and I'm sure any developers listening can attest to, that early feedback, it does a lot to kind of give you that focus that you need. Otherwise, you may just end up going around in a circle with yourself trying to figure out, you know, is this a good system? Let me make something else. Oh, that doesn't work. Let me go back to this. But now, what if I do this? And again, it's these kinds of things that can easily balloon a project out and can lead to kind of like that unfocused nature. Yeah. I mean, I, you, as always, like you do need there always needs to be like a creative vision and there needs to be like a, a a clear path of like how the game is supposed to um develop and function but um i mean still there's so many moving parts in a game that there's there's a lot of things that you might not have thought of and that uh, to a player are just like very obvious um hindrances in in like enjoying the game and mm -hmm. they'll definitely point them out to you if you you know if you ask for feedback and if you motivate feedback which we've always done like we've always been very straightforward in saying that we we uh we welcome players' feedback and that we you know we welcome everyone to the forums we welcome everyone to the discord and everyone listening is also you know welcome to check those out um and that just you know did a lot for us because you know if you ask for it uh you know people are going to be honest with you and they'll give you a lot to work with mm -hmm. yep. and as you said like when you're asking for that information it's just very easy to get a lot of really good feedback from players as to what they're having struggle or what they're struggling with and I think for a lot of developers especially first timers they may think oh if my game is you know 100 hours long how can I ever get feedback from someone that can help me but the thing is the elements that we've talked about tutorial design UI design and just basic gameplay instructions this is stuff people find out within like the first you know 15 20 seconds of loading your game up and <laughs> That kind of information is invaluable in terms of making your experience as easy to get into as possible. Yeah. No. Once people are invested, they're you know, the more you're 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 invested in the game, the more you're willing to put up put up with. Of course, you know, you're mm -hmm. you're gonna, um, you you you're right. You have to catch the player or get the player going for the first. I, I'm not sure like what exactly it would be like maybe five maybe ten maybe fifteen minutes, mm -hmm. but at some point there you know after fifteen maybe twenty minutes at the very latest they're invested enough to figure things out and if something stumps them at that point they'll be you know they won't be like wow this is stupid i hate this they'll be more like oh wow i guess you know i don't understand how this works yet what what could be the solution here and um so the real challenge or the most important thing is really surviving those first uh you know 10 to 15 minutes let's say and that's what your main focus really should be on when designing uh any sort of like tutorial mm-hmm now let me check our time. I know we're getting just to the hour. And for those of you watching us or listening to us live or recorded, there's an eight-hour time difference. So I know it's getting a little bit late for you, Max. So we'll begin to wrap things up here. And again, it's been a great chat. And hopefully in the future, we can have you or the rest of Crunchyleaf on for a follow-up. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, we have a new game in the works right now. So um, there's going to be... A uh, you know, a next project that we can happily talk about when it when it comes out or when it's announced. Uh, so yeah, I'd be happy to be on here again. Great. And that actually took me to my next question. I was curious what you guys are working on now that the Redux edition is out. Um, well, uh, the second game that's in the works is called Stars of Icarus. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been working on it for quite some time too. And uh, we're about to... Um, make a big announcement about that game so there's going to be something big happening uh, probably in about a month or two from now so yeah if you want you can you can uh keep tuned on our twitter uh i think uh it's you know crunchy leaf game without the s at the end so uh, check us out and follow us there and yeah you'll know as soon as uh the news comes out is it, uh, I guess without spoiling things too much is it going to be a, another space sim game or will it be a different genre um, it's going to be um, a space action game. <laughs> so, uh, roguelike space action game, I can say that much. <laughs> Great. 
I guess here's one other question. Do you guys, are you guys going to be doing any more work on Death War, or do you think that you're going to finally move away from it now? Uh, I think we're going to keep working on it. Um, it's just been such an enjoyable experience for us, and, um, you know, all of us just really love the game, so I, I just, I guess there's no reason to ever stop. Uh, <laughs> the, the one thing that kind of... Um, that would help is of course if the game does pick up more traction right now because you know sales have kind of slowed down a little bit so and reviews aren't coming in uh, as much right now so um we're kind of thinking about ways to you know increase increase that like get players uh you know coming back to the game and get reviews going again um because that just motivates us again to you know add more things to the game so um There'll be an update coming fairly soon, actually. I think it's only, uh, yeah, maybe a month or two from now as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. And I guess here's one final question, like design-related question for you, Max, and then we'll wrap it up. But one thing that I was kind of curious about, again, when it comes to a genre like space sim, grand strategy, anything that's kind of really open-ended like that, it does leave the door open for, you know, a ton of additional content, systems you can add, more gameplay, things along those lines. How did you and the rest of Crunchy Leap kind of decide or focus on what game systems you wanted to expand on Death War and which ones may have been either too big or too unwieldy for that kind of design? Mm. Well, it's a discussion, you know, a discussion mm -hmm. in the team. There's, there's certain things like uh, the combat that we would have liked to have spent more time on, but um, it just didn't work out that way, uh, pretty much. Uh, there's other areas that we spent a lot of time on improving that um, have become much more, uh, you know, than they used to be, uh, like the, the derelict you can explore. It used to be just, you go into a derelict, and there's one um, crate laying there that you can open, and then you leave it again. That's That was pretty much all there was. And now there's, like, a uh, procedurally generated inside of the uh, derelict. It's, you know, there's these walls that you can shoot, and you can, you know, go and bur burst through the walls. There's crates everywhere. There's enemies everywhere. There's, um, you know, magazines you can find and collect. There's all these crazy things now. So um, it's kind of just like a discussion in the team and figuring out who wants to do what, and then, um, yeah, and then prioritizing those things. Mm-hmm. And again, like, if we had the time, we could probably spend a good 30, 40 minutes on this very topic. Because it is very challenging when you're kind of given, I guess, quote-unquote carte blanche when it comes to designing games like this. And we've seen many developers kind of struggle with the fact that you have complete freedom to make whatever you want. So how do you focus that? Um, well, I mean, it's just like deciding on uh, who, you know, wants to do what. Um... <laughs> I have certain, you know, preferences, and and Mike and Matt have certain preferences, and everyone kind of gets a little bit, you know, to say, and then we argue <laughs> for a while about well, who's right, and uh, decide on one, and that gets done in the end. So, uh, yeah, I kind of I think it's just like you know, decision by consensus. Mm hmm. All right, but I think with that, again, it's getting a bit late here for you, and. Um, hopefully we'll get some more interest, I think, recording-wise. I think when you get too many people, I think maybe we started the stream a little too early in the day for some people. But we're going to wrap things up here for our developer live stream. I'll be back on for those of you watching this live around 10 or 9.30 EST tonight for some game streaming. But uh, for you, Max, and the rest of Crunchy Leaf, do you have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to say to the fans to end the cast on? Um, no, I mean, like, thank you very much for having me on the cast. Uh, it was very fun. Um, yeah, if, if anyone wants to check out the game, you can probably just Google it, or maybe there's going to be a link added. Um, mm -hmm. You can find it on Steam. Um, there is, I can probably give away, there is a, a sale coming up very soon, so you might just want to wishlist it and wait a couple more days uh, for a very, very, very close sale. Uh, you'll be very happy, I think. <laughs> Great. But... I think with that said, we'll end things here. And be sure to check out Max and Crunchy Leaf as well. I'll include links to your Twitter and, of course, to the store page. Are there any other major places if people want to follow you guys on? Uh, Twitter is probably the best. We keep that uh, updated the most. Uh, you can keep, follow on Facebook as well. We usually you know, post there too. But, um, yeah, I think Twitter is by far like the, the best place to follow us. 
Alright, great. And you and I hang on Skype for like 30 seconds after we end the stream. We just have a few wrap-up questions for you, Max. But sure. I think with that, we will end things here. So thank you so much for watching this, whether you're enjoying this live or recorded. If you are watching this recorded in the future and like to get access to these recorded talks earlier and ad-free, be sure to check out patreon.com slash wbicer to get VIP access. But that is going to do it for us for right now. So thanks again for watching. I will see you all later for our game stream. And I'm sure we'll talk to Max and the rest of Crunchy Leaf in the future. But until then, have a great day, folks, and I'll see you all later.